good. Okay. So good evening, everyone. My name is Oscar de la Torre. I'm a member of the city council here in the city of Santa Monica. And we're here in the uh, heart of the Pico neighborhood and Pico Youth and Family Center. Uh, very glad to be here in this space. Uh, there have been many uh, good movements that have uh, come out of the Pico Youth and Family Center. We have a recording studio. Uh, we have a film program. And we have great young people that are creating here. Uh, our motto at the Pico Youth and Family Center is peace, unity, and social justice. And it's so uh, important that we're here in this space today um, because today, really one of the things that we will talk about mostly is unity and how we can uh, be more united uh, you know, in Los Angeles and how we can uh, build community. Um, and we're, we're very uh, fortunate to have the panelists, that's the, the panel that's uh, with us here today. Uh, we will uh, hear first from Mr. Ron Wilkins. And uh, Ron is a father. A long-time activist, uh, someone who's been in the movement here in Los Angeles for many years. Uh, he's a, a mentor, a role model, someone that uh, I look up to. Uh, and actually, everybody on the panel, one thing that, that's so exciting to be on this panel is that every individual, Maria Rivanco, Lucero Hernandez, and Juan Wilkins, uh, I have a great deal of admiration for them because uh, they are consistent. These are people that I've known. I know Maria when she was in high school. She was an activist uh, back then, and she's to this day, still an activist. And uh, Lisa Hernandez as well, when I first met Lisa, uh, she was doing neighbor organizing and uh, environmental justice work, and uh, she's still doing that work today. And Ron Wilkins, uh, what can I say about Ron Wilkins? I mean, he's just been uh, a leader, a fighter, uh, someone who has just been uh, organizing and, 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 and a professor, you know, a scholar, um, someone who has, I think, done more around uh, black brown relations in the city of Los Angeles than anyone else, anyone else I know. So uh, uh, let's get right into it. What, we have a, a great panel, and, and I, I want to, uh, we have a lot of good questions, but um, I, I just want to go back to this uh, real important point that, you know, we can't spell the word community without the word unity. Um, and our first task today is, is, is going to be, uh, after Ron gives his presentation, to talk about what occurred in Los Angeles you know, with the uh, city council members and the president of the Los Angeles County Federation of Labor. Uh, they had a discussion around uh, redistricting in Los Angeles, and there were a number of very uh, racist and unfortunate comments that were made. And it's just been you know, a groundswell of people calling for resignations. There have been at least two resignations, right? Nuri Martinez, uh, city council William Martinez has resigned, and also uh, the president of the LA County Federation of Labor, Ron Herrera, has resigned, and there's been calls uh, for uh, re for the resignation of uh, uh, Kevin De Leon and also Gil Cedillo, and they haven't resigned. And so, uh, still a big controversial issue, but it's also a teachable moment, right? An opportunity for us to engage in this discussion, uh, to learn, to deepen our understanding of the issues that are raised because of this incident, but more importantly, to not get stuck there, to think about how do we transcend that? How do we, you know, uh, enter this uh, healing process and from there, uh, a plan to, to create a more just and a more um, united Los Angeles. So uh, with that, let's uh, get right into it. We have uh, Ron Wilkins who has uh, years of, of experience in these movements and also uh, has a, a perspective that I think will be very educational for everyone around the issue of uh, black brown relations and intercultural relations in general. So, uh, and, I, and I first uh, met Ron when I was working at Santa Monica High School. We both worked uh, under the leadership of uh, Sylvie Rousseau, Dr. Sylvie Rousseau at Santa Monica High School. She was the first uh, African American, first black woman uh, to lead Santa Monica High School. And we did a lot of work around black brown relations. In fact, Beyond Santa Monica, we, we did work uh, in Los Angeles when there was violence, uh, when high schools broke out in violence at Locke High School in particular. I remember we, we were called on to do some work there at that high school. Uh, so uh, Ron just has a, a great amount of experience. I want to go ahead and uh, pass it on to uh, Brother Ron Wilkins. Okay. I want to first say thank you. Pleasant greetings to all of you who are present and have tuned into this event. And my thanks to event organizers for inviting me. I'm gonna go wash my hands. Outset. Hanson, what are you gonna do? I share um, essay. Your yes. essay. Yes. Okay. Okay. 
and anti-blackness in with classism. Recent events have revealed that within the Brown community, a significant number of persons with lighter complexions identify color-wise with the white supremacist ruling elite who run this country and dominate the world and are themselves determined to become exploiters. The criminal dehumanization, rejection, and exploitation of their darker, naive, and disorganized sisters and brothers is the way that this works. Most aspects of this same phenomenon occurs among Black people, but is less apparent because we are darker genetically. Listen carefully to what I'm saying. With rare and very noteworthy exceptions, the Democratic history has demonstrated this, that it is entirely possible for an unethical member of one's own race to get elected into public office, sell out, and collaborate with our people's enemies. It also means, and hear me well, that if we intend to end discrimination, exploitation, and govern ourselves, we must end the nonsensical practice of voting for this Democrat over that Republican, or in other words, three to be over three to dumb, and take all the power away from those who have selfishly mismanaged powers since the establishment of this criminal empire. Redirect and manage it ourselves. It requires enormous organization and is doable, but that is another discussion. Before I say more, permit me to say for the record that the US Census Bureau in 2007 made public that 303 US counties out of the 300 out of the 3,141 counties that make up the United States had a majority people of color, which were mostly black and brown. That's almost one in 10. Just recently, the government has acknowledged that people of color now comprise the majority in the, in the entire United States. Bear this in mind, and I hope that you're taking notes. The skeptics and the naysayers swear that recent events underscore their claim that black and brown people always have and will forever be divided against one another. Brother Malcolm X, one of our greatest leaders and teachers once said, of all our studies, history is best qualified to reward our research. Well, I've come to provide you with the incredibly beautiful yet hidden history of grassroots brown and black solidarity that you must know and build upon if black and brown people are going to take destiny into their own hands, prevail over our class enemies, no matter what their color or complexion, and determine their own lives. Making the best use of the limited time that I have, <coughs> we begin chronologically, hold up an occasional image here and there, and merely highlight historical intersections where our two peoples aided defended or joined together with one another, which was usually during the worst of times. So I want to make the best use of the short time that I have, and uh, organizers have been very generous for giving me the time that they've given me. Um, I want to talk about this history. It's important to know this history and to build upon it. And it's a history that's not being taught in the public schools of this country. It's not being taught in the universities in this country. Um, and we are given a lot of lies and a lot of, uh, so I wanna begin talking about the earliest encounter between the people of the Americas in Mexico. And interestingly enough, of course, the four individuals that uh, are central to this racist uh, event that has taken place that we are uh, meeting around are all Mexicanos. Uh, the earliest encounter between the people of Mexico and Black people, African people, took place in 800 BC. Uh, BC meaning before the Christian era. It's also referred to oftentimes as prehistory. For many white people, it's prehistory or prehistoric because they weren't around. 
So they call it prehistory, but it's still history. It's history that was made between our people. Uh, this contact between the Olmec civilization and Egyptian civilization. Egyptian uh, fighters, the uh, military people and naval people uh, set out from Africa during that time. They went out to sea in ships looking for places in other parts of the world where they could get uh, possibly tin and bronze, bronze as for armaments and for weapons. And if you leave the West African coast, the ocean currents, once you get out beyond the, the, some of the islands off the West African coast, will take you to the Gulf side of Mexico and Veracruz. And I climbed up the, uh, the elevations there to the ceremonial plaza. But I took this picture in one of the, in one of the museums. They also have the museum at Villa Hermosa where many of the Olmec heads uh, were placed there. If you know the work of Dr. Ivan Van Sertema, a great historian who has since passed on, uh, he, uh, he wrote a book um, and he described this early contact. And he said it was very friendly that both groups embraced one another. And it was from that period on that time period that we saw in Mexico the uh, construction of the first pyramids. We also saw, in some cases, uh, people being buried erect, which was also an Egyptian practice. Uh, we also saw the use of the color purple, which was a color that was reserved for people uh, who held high positions in society. We saw that in Mexico for the first time. Uh, so I wanted to share that piece. Um, that suggests that this, and lets us know, that this history of solidarity between our two people is not something that's new. It's very old, it goes way back. And uh, it's important that we not let down our ancestors by having um, petty quarrels or getting involved in uh, some of this racial stuff that, uh, has been exhibited by some of our people on both sides. Okay, um, I want to come forward from the uh, Olmecs up until the uh, late 1500s, early 1600s uh, in Mexico. You had uh, Yanga. You may have heard of Yanga. Yanga was an African that had been had been enslaved by the Spaniards and brought to New Spain as Mexico was called. And you should know that the Spanish had 300 years of slavery in uh, Mexico and slavery began in Mexico and ended in Mexico before it began in the inside. That's erected in the town named for him. Uh, Yanga established in 1609, a village that was fortified, that was self-sustaining, well-defended, and uh, you should know that Yanga, for some 38 years, he and his people, uh, from that, their base of that, that in the, in this, uh, fortification, uh, they attack Spanish convoys, uh, they attack Spanish haciendas. They were a real problem for the Spanish. They had the support of the indigenous people in the surrounding areas for a long time. The town was referred to as San Domenzo de los Negros. But Mexican University students in the 1930s, knowing its true history, insisted that it be renamed for its founder. And so the name was changed to Yanga. I took this photograph of Yanga. Yanga, of course, has a, a machete in one hand, and with from his other wrist, he's breaking a chain from a sugar mill because Africans were brought to New Spain, as Mexico was called, to work the sugar plantation primarily. And that's what Yanga and others were forced to do. You should know that 1609 is a full 200 years before the struggle for Mexican independence began. And here was a black man fighting against Spaniards who had uh, were brutalizing and taking advantage of Mexican people. He was fighting against them. And again, this lets us know that they, this is some solidarity. It's, it's a black man fighting against the 
expand it in a country that, of course, don't look like it. So I wanted to share that. And then moving forward in history, from 1609, uh, actually around that same period, you had what was known, a group known as the 33. These were 33 African people, men and women, who, uh, in a way similar to what Yonder was doing, they fought the Spanish, and in, but in their case, they were defeated. And 33 of them were captured by the Spaniards. They were marched to, uh, across the country, to uh, Mexico City, and they were all executed and beheaded. I don't have that graphic to show you, but in Mexican history, it's known as the 33. Again, here are black people in Mexico, Afro-Mexicans, fighting against the enemies of Mexico's people, uh, the people of the Spanish. Uh, but I wanted to also share that. We also had, in 1680, the Pueblo Revolt. You may have heard of the Pueblo Revolt. In present-day New Mexico, along both sides of the Rio Grande, the Pueblo indigenous people who had been uh, conquered by the Spaniards, humiliated, who had their uh, spiritual beliefs brushed aside, uh, and had the Catholic Spaniards brought the Catholic Church, imposed the church and its doctrine on the indigenous people, uh, brought in their Bibles and had soldiers to back them up. Well, it was Pope, the leader of the Pueblo people, who organized an uprising in 1680. And on a given day, in all of, in all of the villages, the people rose up, attacked the Spaniards, killed the Spanish soldiers, took their horses, burned the Bibles, burned the Catholic Church, ran the priests out. And for a dozen years, uh, that area was liberated under the control of the Pueblo people. Uh, so you should know of the Pueblo revolt. The historical accounts say that there were also Africans that assisted the Pueblo people in their fight against the Spanish. One account even says that an African led an uprising, which I tend to doubt. But um, anyway, again, this shows this camaraderie between indigenous people in this part of the world and the uh, uh, the Africans who were here. Now let's come forward in history to uh, the struggle for Mexico's independence, which uh, of course began in 1810. It was a revolutionary priest, Father Hidalgo, who called on Mexico's people to rise up and overthrow Spanish rule and drive the Spanish out. Father Hidalgo also made clear that uh, slavery would be eliminated, so that it was not just a struggle to win Mexico's independence. Africans who had been enslaved by the Spanish rallied to this call and joined the Mexican forces to fight the Spanish. Father Hidalgo lasted about nine months on the battlefield. He was uh, eventually captured and along with his top aides, executed and beheaded by the Spanish. The Spanish had a habit of beheading you and posting your hair, your severed hair, out in public, and so on. Uh, the leadership of the main Mexican army was taken up by one of his followers, a man named Jose Morelos, who had been a priest, who became a general. And for the next five years, he led the Mexican forces on the battlefield. Uh, Father Morelos, in Mexico today, many of the images you see of him do not show him with African roots. We don't show him that way. Father Morales, I'm sorry, General Morales, General Morales, uh, he too was eventually captured after some five years and uh, executed by the Spanish. There's an interesting story uh, It goes like this. There was an occasion where uh, General Morelos and his men captured a Spanish militia near Acapulco. And uh, when they captured these men, they set them down on the ground and uh, General Morelos began to lecture them on the importance of freedom. 
and the importance of in the, in the uh, why it was so necessary to fight for Mexico's independence. What was interesting about this militia is that all of its members were black. He set them on the ground, he began to lecture them, and some of these men, or practically all of them, they, uh, they weren't interested in hearing what he had to say. They turned their backs on him. Some of them were grumbling and so on. So he stepped over to his horse nearby, and he reached up to behind the saddle on his horse, and he retrieved a branding iron. And he brought this branding iron to where the men were seated. And he waved it in their face, faces, and he said, would you rather return to this, or will you switch sides and fight for us, fight for our people? They looked at that brand new iron, they said, we'll change sides, and we fight with you, we fight on your side. Very interesting. And you might add, you might wonder, what's what are black men doing fighting for the Spanish, when the Spanish is who had enslaved them? But which raises the same question that I always raise inside the United States. Why would black men fight for this country when it was not very long ago that the same people that they fight alongside and fight for sold their mama? You gonna sell my mama and I'm gonna fight for you? Get out of here. And I make the point when the Vietnam War was going on, there was a draft. I refused to go. I said, there's no way I'm going. One of the reasons why I'm very conscious and I've spent most of my life engaged in struggle and taking on this government. My mother was born in Texas. I went a couple of years ago, by the way, my mother has since passed on and I have so much love for her, so many great memories. She, uh, she, went, she was born in Calvert, Texas. And she, uh, she went to the college school and they used to come around to her classroom in the colored school, pull her out of class, take her to the nearby cotton field to chop cotton. This happened on a regular basis. She very much resented that. And when me and my siblings were very small, she used to tell us these stories. And this is what helped put me on this path to struggling against the system. Uh, I do it for my mom, and I do it for our other ancestors. I found out too that. Uh, the oldest known member on our family tree is a woman whose name happened to be Harriet. And she was uh, uh, in Culpeper County, Virginia, owned by a white man with the last name Richards. And he took her and her five children and put them on a wagon a couple of years before the start of the Civil War and took them from Culpeper County, Virginia, to Milan County, Texas. And in the town of Milan, I mean, the county of Milan, there's a town called Rockdale. And that's where the family began to sprout uh, from there. Uh, about seven or eight miles from, from Rockdale is the town of Calvert, where my mother was born. Uh, but this is why I struggle, because I, I cannot let down my ancestors. I cannot let down Harry, I cannot let down my mom and so many others. And I think that's important that you know that. And that you have a responsibility too. Your ancestors struggled, stood up, took risks, made sacrifices so that you can have a better life. And you have to struggle. You're obligated, you, have, you can't get around it. You, you must struggle and you must take struggle to the grave. That is a responsibility of young people. And those who have come later, like myself, all of us in this room, we have that responsibility to our ancestors. So I, uh, but I wanted to, I wanted to share that. Watching my time, mm -hmm. uh, during the struggle for independence, most of the battles between the Mexicanos and the Spaniards. Took place, took place in uh, places in an area, areas known as the Tierra Caliente or the hot lowlands on both the Pacific coast side of Mexico. This was about a 50 mile by uh, 150 mile stretch of land. And on the Gulf side, the same was, was true 50 miles by roughly 150 mile stretch. This is where most of the battles between Mexican forces and Spanish forces took place. These areas were sparsely populated. 
But the people who were there in the greatest numbers who lived in those areas were African people, were Black people. And they had enormous support to the Mexican border. On the Gulf side, the, um, the Spanish ships would die. And they would send runners. They would send runners from their ships with messages and so on to take the Mexico City. And on that Gulf side, for roughly five years of the 11 year war, there was, a, there was a string of small villages that were primarily black. The population was primarily black. And they cut the runners off. They killed them. They took the messages. They could not get a runner from their ships to Mexico City because of the enormous support that black people were giving to the war effort. The Spanish forces even called, referred to the Mexican army is Ejercito Moreno of the Dark Army because they said that they saw the other Mexican people. So again, it's important that we know this history. Now you could say, I'm just here talking because the naysayers and the other people who say that there's never been any solidarity or any of that between Mexican and black people, they say that that's always been the case. Well, here are the two main leaders of the independence struggle. On the left, on this side here, you see Jose Morelos, okay? And over on this other side, you see Vicente Ramon Guerrero. These are rare uh, drawings of them that I photographed while in Mexico uh, and I brought back here. And I brought them, and one of the things that really makes very, it's been made very clear here, both these men have dark complexions, they have African roots. So the military leadership in Mexico fighting against the Spanish was led by Afro-Mexicans. You hear me? Afro-Mexicans. They had a man, a Mexican captain, his name was Jose Andres Carranza. He was a black captain in the Mexican army. He was very much resented by the Spanish because every time on many occasions when the Spanish forces were about to fight the Mexican forces, he would run to the front of the Mexican lines. He'd shout insults at the Spanish. He'd give them the finger. He'd talk about the mama. He would curse them. They would shoot at him. And he would dodge the bullets. And he would retreat deeper into the Mexican side. And that's when the battle would get under the, underway. But Jose Andreas Carranza is someone that our young people in the schools of this country and in the schools of Mexico, for that matter, don't hear about. All right? But we need to know it, we need to teach it, and we need to build on it. Because this, again, is, shows the solidarity that we're talking about. All right? I want to move on. Uh, by the way, uh, Jose Morelos was captured after five years of leading Mexican forces. And then it was Guerrero, Vicente Guerrero, who took up the leadership of the main Mexican army. And he's the one that saw the country through to independence. He's also the one who became Mexico's second president and outlawed slavery in all the Mexican Republic. He grew up illiterate as a mule driver. He never went to school, but he wanted education for all of Mexico's people. He wanted all of them to become literate. So he had schools being, being built and all of that. We should remember him for that. We should also remember him because he was not only Mexican, he was Mexican, but he was also African. If I ask you, what's the significance of February 14th? And I go into a lot of schools. I ask the students, what's the, what's the value? What's the meaning? Of, what's significant about February 14th? What do they say? Valentine's, Valentine's Day. Day. Then the next question I ask them, See, if you're Italian, raise your hand. No hands go up. That's an Italian. That comes out of the Italian folklore. That's their culture. You're not no Italian. You're an African. You're a Mexican. What are you doing uh, remembering February 14th? February 14th, 1831, is when Vicente Ramon Guerrero, who had been tricked by his adversaries and went on <coughs> a ship 
and was taken captive and was later executed, that's the day he was executed. That's the day we should remember him for all of his deeds, all his contributions for who he was and what he means to black, brown, solidarity and all of that. But we don't because we caught up in somebody else's culture. That's what they call miseducation, all right? And so we need to be clear about that. Um, so I wanna move on. Um, this is a tough one, not a tough one. Um, I wanna move on to, don't have a time to hit on all of these dates where we supported one another, uh, defended, uh, joined together. But um, I wanna come up to 1836. 1836, March 6, 1836 is the day the Alamo fell. And in this country, they have a habit of saying, remember the Alamo. All right? I, I say this and I say it, don't take it the wrong way. I say remember the Mexicans. <laughs> because 200 plus mostly white men who were slave owners or would be slave owners or mercenaries were all wiped out by the Mexican army led by Santa Ana. Uh, among them were people like Baby Crockett, who was a big supporter of slavery, who was legendary in the eyes of whites in this country. Uh, you had, uh, uh, what was his name? Uh, Jim Bowie. We all know about the Bowie knife. Jim Bowie and his brother were big slave owners in Louisiana, but he had ended up there in Texas. He had slaves, enslaved people with him there inside the Alamo. By the way, all the enslaved people were spared by the Mexican army, okay? You also had, uh, what's his name? Um, William Travis, who was the commander of the fort. He was executed. And by the way, if we're gonna build on his history and go forward, we must know it. And part of how you know it is you get out and you go yourself. I've gone to the Alamo. I went inside the Alamo, I went on the tour. And the woman leading the tour, white woman was, had all these white people and I'm in the group I'm, I'm by myself. And, and the, the woman is, is telling these men and women that uh, William Travis, Colonel Travis, and all these brave Texas were Texans, white Texans were fighting against these marauding Mexicans who were coming over the walls, thousands of them. And uh, these men, Travis and the others, were all fighting for liberty. And then in the next sentence, she says that William Travis owned a slave named Joe. So I'm taking notes. How is it in the first sentence, you're fighting for liberty, and then in the next sentence, you've taken the liberty away from, from Joe? But you're not supposed to pick up on that, you see? And so um, that's a day that ought to be a day for great celebrations among Black people all over this country and all over the world, as well as Mexican people, because they defeated people who were bound to, who were about enslaving Black people. But we don't celebrate it, again, because we don't know our history. We don't, we don't, we don't, just like I said, we don't know about uh, Vicente Ramon Guerrero. We don't know February 14th. I also celebrate June 25th. I shouldn't get off on that, but June 25th is when uh, Chief Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull wiped out George Custer and the 7th Cavalry. All right? That was in 1876. The United States was set to celebrate 100 years of control of indigenous people's land, the United States. They were, about to, they were about to have all these parties. And when news leaked out that Custer and his band had been wiped out, it put the damper on the damn party. People on the celebrations. So June 25th, and by the way, because that was just uh, by about a week or so from July 4th, that would have been the 100 years uh, since the founding, 1776, of the United States by these whites. But we don't celebrate it 
that victory because again, we don't know our history. And if you don't know our history, there's a saying that those who don't know their history will we have will be bound to be living. We have to be very careful. Want to move on in terms of time. Um, I want to come up to uh, Mexico was under Spanish rule. The people of Mexico were against slavery. They were against slavery. And that's why they said that the struggle would not be one just to win independence, but also to end slavery. You should also know that from 1822 until 1865, the end of the Civil War, the United States put pressure on Mexico year after year to enter into fugitive slave agreements and return Black people from the United States that had run away from the United States south into Mexico, where Mexican people embraced us, fed us, defended us, and did all that. Uh, they tried to force Mexico to enter into these agreements. Mexico staunchly refused. One needs to know that. It said that by the year 1855, the whites had put it out in this country that roughly 5,000 Black people had escaped south in across Texas, through Texas, into Mexico with the aid of Mexicans. Mexican people used to put rafts out in the middle of the Rio Grande River and ropes that we could come and we put on a rope and get on a raft to cross the river. They, they aided us. I even read one account where a white man had come into Mexico with a pistol and had grabbed a black man and claimed him as his property and, was, and when some Mexican people confronted him and said, what are you doing? He said, I'm here to get my property. He said, you're not touching this man. He pulled his gun. They drew down on him and blew him away. He said, Mexican people blew a white slave over away. Did you know that? You ever hear that in history? You ain't been taught that in no school. But this is the history, okay? Now I want to come up, if I can, to something else that we don't hear about in school, or we should, and hear about it in a proper way. That is in 1848, after a two year war, the United States took 55% of Mexico's land and made it their own. All of the present day Southwest is, was Mexico. This is occupied Mexico. That was a criminal act. In the schools of this country, it's not being taught that that was a criminal. It's never been said that that was a criminal act. If I come in your house and pull a weapon on you and order you out and tell you that if you try to set foot back in this house, you better have some papers that I uh, approve, where I'm showing that I approve your coming, uh, I, that, that's wrong. That's all wrong. But nowhere in the schools of this country is that taught. Let me hit on a couple other things, and then I'll, I'll, I'll move on. 1857 was really interesting. Oh, by the way, the land that they took from Mexico was the most fertile. Mexican people, historically, culturally, had a habit of coming northward in Mexico because the more fertile lands were in what is now the United States Southwest. So they came here so they could earn better money and have a better life. So it's normal, it's natural for Mexican people to, to move north, to come north. And so that should not surprise us. We need to know that. I want to come up to 1857. 1857 was an interesting year because a black man by the name of Dred Scott, most of us have heard of Dred Scott, he had been enslaved by the whites, he and his wife. They were held in Missouri and the, their owner took them from Missouri northward into a so-called free state, the Illinois, and some other areas. They were in these areas for about several years. And Dred Scott managed to get hold of some attorneys. And he filed suit to try to secure his wife and his own freedom. The US Supreme Court decided and made it very clear that a black that he was to remain a slave, he was to remain the property of this white man, and that Black people had no rights that whites were bound to respect. This was 1857. That same year in Mexico, the Mexican Congress adopted Article 13, which declared 
that any enslaved person that sets foot on Mexican soil is from that moment on free. This is a contrast between two countries. Shows the difference. And again, uh, we talk about black ground solidarity. These are the examples. Cinco de Mayo, we come up with 1862. We all know Cinco de Mayo. Uh, Cinco de Mayo, very important. Many black people say, well, it ain't about me, it's about those Mexicans. It is about you because the French that invaded Mexico, and I've been to Puebla, I went to the fort, I looked over the battlefield. The, uh, the French that invaded Mexico were supporters of the Confederacy because in 1862, the Civil War was being fought in the United States. Civil War went from 1861 to 1865. And the uh, French that had invaded uh, were turned back they were considered one of the best armies of that day, but they were turned back by some very determined Mexican fighters, which we need to be celebrating. But we also should celebrate it because those, as I said, those French supported the Confederacy. They had hoped that a French victory over Mexico would open up the possibility of them regaining lost land and opportunities in the Western Hemisphere. Because remember in 1804 and 80, the Haitians, Black Haitians, had driven the French out and crushed the, the slave, it ended the, the French slave colony that Haiti had, been, had become. Okay? Uh, anyway, it needs to be clear that when Cinco de Mayo is celebrated, that I put on the blindfold and go swinging and trying to knock down the stuff and enjoying celebrating along with Mexican people because that's that was a victory that benefited all of us. You should also know that, of course, uh, several months later, the French came back with a larger force. They defeated Mexican forces. They took control of Mexico from 1862 for a time. They dominated the country. They Napoleon III, who had sent the French forces there, imposed on Mexican people, Maximilian, with this witch, uh, what was her name? Carlota. Carlota. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <laughs> imposed this on Mexico's people. And um, it was only, what's interesting, I'm talking about battles now, what's interesting is the French were in control. 1865, the Civil War ended in this country. 3,000 USCT, you may have never heard USCT, that means United States Colored Troops. These were Union, these were Black Union troops that had joined the Union Army because uh, Lincoln had issued the Emancipation Proclamation so Black troops could help the North win the war against the South. These Black troops, 3,000 of them in Texas, crossed the Texas border into Mexico and joined Mexican forces to wage a struggle against the French who dominated Mexico. And in 18, 1867, the French were defeated. Maximilian was captured and executed. All of this with the help of black soldiers. And why did black soldiers go into Mexico? Because they were mindful of the fact that thousands of black people who had run, been running away from slavery went south to south, went from the south in through Texas into Mexico and were given refuge by Mexican people. And they were so grateful that they were returning the favor to Mexican people. This is history that one has to know, okay? I wanna try to wrap it up. I have on an interesting shirt. I think it's interesting because I love these brothers here. Miriano Zapata, by the way, had African roots. I should have brought a picture of him. Uh, Zapata said, seek justice from tyrannical governments, not with a hat in your hand or with a rifle in your fist. I'm down with that. I hope you're down with it. Okay? And clearly, I wore this shirt because obviously these men, one man cannot be the enemy of the other because both of them are armed and they stand together. So obviously they're on the same side. There were many black people who fought on the side of uh, Zapata. I think of... Uh, Colonel Carmen Amelia Robles, a bad sister. They got a picture of her sitting in a chair and she's got a pistol in the holster on the right. 
And they say she used to fire that pistol with her right hand, and with her left hand, she puffed on a cigar. <laughs> Bad sister, she rode with Sapphire. But we, we have to know this. We have to know these histories. We have to know the history. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to wrap it up now here. During the Mexican uh, Revolution, they also had a revolutionary manifesto put out called the Plan of San Diego. This was 1915. It upset a lot of white people inside the United States because this manifesto made it clear, said that what the Mexican people should rise up and do is kill all the white males, 16 and older, retake the Southwest from the United States. They appealed to black people to join their forces. They also made it clear in the manifesto that they uh, were going to offer, they were offering some of the land, some of the Southwest to black people. And this again, revolutionary document, but it, was, it helped uh, promote the solidarity between the two groups. I want to mention a couple of other last things and move on. Diego Rivera, you've heard the name Diego Rivera, probably the world's greatest murals, all right? Diego Rivera was not only hated, because he was a socialist, a communist, but also because he was black. He had African roots. He had full lips. You know, he had uh, kinky hair, broad nose, and uh, we need to know that. There are schools, uh, schools right here in LA and around, named for Diego Rivera, and I bet not one of the students in those schools had ever been told that Diego Rivera was African. He was an Afro-Mexican. These are things that are hidden and things that we need to struggle against. One of the last things I want to mention is we know about Cesar Chavez and the, uh, the United Farm Workers Union. Uh, one of the people who worked very closely with Cesar Chavez, he's passed on his name, is Mac Lyons. I met Mac Lyons back in the, about 1973, 74. I was coming out of jail in Georgia. I had been organizing some black farm workers on a black owned, owned farm in Southwest Georgia. They were being abused, being paid on average 67 cents an hour. I was arrested on the picket line. And I had called before my arrest, I had called from Georgia to Florida right next door to Mac Lyons. Mac Lyons was Florida State Director for the United Farm Workers Union. Most people don't know Mac Lyons, by the way, is black. Born in Texas, grew up poor in the fields, hard worker, big guy. I used to like the way he would talk to the owners of his farm. He'd say, he would say something, he'd say, but you know what I mean? He'd be looking at you. He was so big, you have to pay attention to what he was saying. Because <laughs> he's saying, you, did you, did you, did you, you know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? But um, he got, in 1974, a contract with Coca-Cola between Coca-Cola and United Farm Workers Union, because Coca-Cola owns Minute Maid, which produces orange juice and controls many of the orange groves there in Florida, and many black workers work there along with others. And uh, we got one of their best contracts. Most people don't know, never heard the name Mac Lyons, but I'm telling you, yes, Mac Lyons is somebody that's real and uh, was, uh, the highest, most highly placed black person in the United Farm Workers Union. So again, that speaks to some of the cross-cultural solidarity, uh, racial solidarity between our two groups. You need to be aware of it. One of the greatest examples of black brown unity has been the Cuban revolution. And I, I, I don't want to fail to mention that. Uh, Stokely Carmichael, also known as Kwame Toure, who I worked with in the student of our board and coordinating committee since passed on once said that Fidel Castro was the blackest man in the Caribbean because at one point Fidel and the Cubans sent 300,000, listen to me, 300,000 of Cuba's best troops and best Soviet made military gear to Southern Angola to fight advancing white South African troops that had invaded Angola and defeated them. This was in uh, the latter part of 1988. And it was the defeat of those South Africans at a place called Quito Carnaval 
that forced the South Africans to get serious at the bargaining table and agree to Namibia's independence, which they also controlled right next to South Africa. They also agreed to schedule black majority rule in South Africa, which happened some years later. And to look good at the bargaining table, they ordered the release of Nelson Mandela. If you ask people today, how did Nelson Mandela get out of prison in South Africa? Well, people can't tell you, but that's how he got out. It's because the South Africans wanted to look good in front of the world after they had been defeated by Cuban forces. But I wanted to just say this in terms of, again, the black, brown solidarity, uh, very real. I didn't show, I, I have a, a book that I put together. It's uh, black and brown uh, history, uh, an illustrated history for beginners. These two girls, by the way, Nidia here, the black girl, is actually the, the aunt of Iri here. <laughs> That's how deep this thing is, how heavy this thing is. And I always tell people, if you, if I'm on the side with you, if we hanging from the same tree, how am I going to fight with you? So the people who put us on the sign together are who we need to be banding together for to fight against so that we can be removed from the sign or be cut down from the tree. So I will stop with that because I've probably taken more than enough time. But uh, this is what I wanted to share. We need to know this history and build on it to go forward. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ron. Uh, a lot of history, a lot of complicated history uh, that I think is very important for, for us to reflect on. Um, but here we find ourselves right now uh, in Santa Monica, uh, as part of Los Angeles. A lot of times we say Santa Monica is separate, but really we're all, we're all one, one big city. And what happens in, in LA affects us, and, and Santa Monica also has an influence throughout. Um, and we had this big incident that occurred, right, where, where uh, you know, you have you have these uh, Latino uh, elected officials with uh, the president of the uh, uh, probably the most powerful uh, union, right, organization in the city of Los Angeles, uh, divvying up the pie, right? They're doing redistricting and they're talking about you know who gets what, and uh, made a lot of negative comments, a lot of racist comments, you know, offended a lot of people, um, and. You know, it, it's we're here because we, we don't want that, you know, to be the narrative, right? We want to shift that narrative. We want to reflect on the history of solidarity, which Ron's talked uh, uh, about. You know, there's, there's been a lot of a lot of times in our history where, where we have worked together, you know, uh, across, you know, the racial divide, right? And, and, and black, brown unity is the way we made progress. But we have this incident and we need to talk about it. We don't want to get stuck in it, but... I wanted to, to, you know, open it up, you know, to uh, Maria and, and, and Lisette and, and Ron. Um, so what was your initial reaction uh, to hearing the comments made by L.A. City Council members and the L.A. County Federation of Labor President? Like, what was the initial, your initial reaction to when you heard those comments? You want to, who wants to go first? Uh, Maria or? or Can I start and then walk? Yeah, 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 sure. Um, so... Um, first, I just want to say thank you um, for allowing me to be part of this panel, um, and uh, it is an honor to, uh, you know, sit with um, Ron Wilkins here at the table and share with um, Krista. So, I, you know, I was actually um, driving down the five with my family. We're coming back from the Bay Area, and I start, uh, my phone starts to blow up, and um, I'm in labor. I'm a union organizer. I've been in the labor movement, actually, since I was in high school at Santa Monica High. Um, so, you know, without giving out my age over 20 years, right? Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, I started to see, uh, and I can't believe what the LA Times is reporting and what my friends are texting. Um, and someone says, it's the audio is available. Uh, and so we're on the five and we have eight hours to drive. And I played the audio. And my husband, who is in the labor movement, I actually had to pause uh, multiple times because we couldn't actually believe what was being, um, you know, what was uh, being said in this leaked audio. Um, and at first I would say that um, I felt a lot of rage. And as the audio went um, deeper and deeper into the discussion, um, I started to really go down into my own experiences of racism 
that I experienced growing up as a child. Um, and it was really painful. And I remember coming home that night um, and I couldn't sleep. I had to journal and really talk about, you know, um, uh, what was being said. And sadly, I wasn't shocked that these Latinos said all the racist and sexist and homophobic and, you know, anti-Indigenous, anti-Black, um, uh, you know, rhetoric in this audio. Um, and it really hit home. And I think it hit home because I was thinking of the times where um, you know, my family is Oaxacan. My mom is Oaxacan. Um, so it was a very personal attack to hear um, Nuri and Gil bash on um, Oaxacan culture um, and on, you know, um, my Black brothers and sisters and siblings, right? Um, and, um, and I grew up in this community. I grew up in the heart of the Pico neighborhood where there was a lot of racial tension, but there was very deliberate work that I know through Ron and Oscar and through the PYFC and Mothers for Justice coming together, doing deliberate work and trying to heal uh, and make amends. So I felt very fortunate um, that I was gifted um, this opportunity of being a critical thinker and being an ally and understanding what solidarity looks like. And what we heard in the audio is anything but solidarity. It's pitting one another and really, um, advancing what I thought was advancing white supremacy values, right? And not be, not exchanging um, solidarity at that discussion. And I think what's really sad for me is that if you listen to the audio closely, there are very important issues that are being raised um, in, in that discussion that get overshadowed by the racist rhetoric, right? That, that they said, um, but I would say, you know, I'm not, I wasn't surprised um, and I'm still trying to process um, and address my own personal trauma, really like uh, the PTSD that I brought forward because um, my dad is from Northern part of Mexico and Guanajuato and my mom's from the Southern part. And my dad's mother, uh, when I was 11, deliberately said, you're too dark to be my granddaughter. She questioned whether I was her blood because I was you know, a couple shades darker than her and shade was really important for her. Um, and so, you know, I think um, trauma is something that stays with us in our bodies. And so when I heard Nuri and Gil say that shit about, you know, um, black folks and indigenous people from our community, um, I think not just for me, but I think for a lot of people, and this is why it exploded, it really forced us to dig deep into those traumas that we didn't want to address and that we didn't want to reckon with, but now here we are. No, it's really, really important to understand because of the impact of slavery and colonization, we live with the residues of that, right? And, uh, you know, the, the, the Spaniards had a caste system. I, I was in a museum in Mexico where I saw, you know, the different categories of people, you know, uh, it, it, they, they broke it down. Like the Spaniards brought this concept, you know, if you were, if you were born in Spain, you know, to Spanish, parents who were a peninsular, uh, if you were uh, born of Spanish parents in Mexico, you were a criollo. Like you were, you, you know, they even distinguished between that. And there was like nine different categories, right? Uh, even, even terms like I've never heard before, like lobo, for example, uh, just, just this caste system that was brought, this European concept, you know, of, of racism, you know, to, to divide people, right? To, 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 but also to create a hierarchy of power and, and, and economy and so forth. Um, but, but uh, Lisa, uh, I wanted to go to you, you know, what was your initial reaction and, 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 and tell us like, you know, what's problematic about what you heard in that audio recording? Yeah. First of all, I wanna say thank you to you as well, Oscar, to all the staff and the youth that are here and that are listening. Um, you know, we do this for you um, primarily. So thank you for joining us. Um, I also wanna acknowledge Tongva Nation that we're on, um, Unceded Lands. Um, I uh, come from Maya Nahuatlenca peoples, and I also have Afro descendant um, uh, genes in, in my blood. So, like, as a Central American, there was a lot to unpack. I think I went through the various stages of, of um, PTSD and of grief. There was like shock, um, denial, um, you know, uh, at points, uh, you know, just anxiety. You know, like, where is this coming from? 
who's putting this out there. Um, when I heard it was a year ago, why now? Why not before? Um, so there's definitely, I feel like a, a feeling of like a puppet tree going on. And I'm wondering, you know, who is behind the scenes, right? Um, I also felt um, shame, you know, and um, for our people, meaning like, uh, and I, I don't mean to group our peoples. I just think that as um, Latino brown peoples, we have a lot of work to do to unpack the various hundreds of years and layers of, of colonization and racialization that came after that. Um, and then also um, on, uh, in terms of the anti-indigeneity -indige that was practiced, you know, everything that was targeted towards the Oaxacan community, when you know that, you know, many of them are, are in our restaurants, are, are basically doing all the different sorts of jobs in our, in our city that um, many migrants come here to do and the lack of appreciation that we have for them as a peoples. Um, and also, you know, the whole entire point of the meeting, which was to do this thing called gerrymandering, right? Like basically taking the voting power or the electoral power of African-Americans, you know, um, throughout the city, not just in South Central where I grew up, but, um, and also that of tenants. So I think that, um, along with all the racist sort of, uh, you know, uh, things that they did and said, there was a plan behind it as well that I felt was horrifying and overwhelming to think like, okay, what do we do now? Because now it's sort of like on our watch, it's our generation. I too lost some sleep, um, one from the shock and then two from like, are we ready for this? Mm -hmm. You know, um, how are we going to move differently? How are we going to demand, you know, the resignations and, and so forth um, that our communities um, deserve so that we can start the healing that needs to happen across the region? Uh, one thing I want to I want to say, I think it's real important as a as a Latino and as someone on the color line who's been, you know, on the lighter on the lighter skin. Right. Because in, in our families, this is something that happens where. Uh, because because of the his, the history, right, um, where you have you have families uh, in our families where people look at you know the darker skin person, let's say, as less than, mm -hmm. or we will hear it in, in in ways like where you know a grandmother would say, oh, you know, use words like, oh, he's so pretty because uh, you know they have light skin or, or 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 blue eyes or you know lighter skin eyes, and then you don't hear the same comments being made on the darker skin child, you know. And, and so that color line is real. Um, the, other, the other thing in terms of like, you know, the, 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 the anti-blackness, you know, that we get, right? The struggle that we have, you know, where, you know, part of it having to do also, we have to say this, you know, what happens in the streets, what happens in the prisons. Like a lot of the racial conflict that I saw uh, and on our streets was coming from the prisons, you know? And, and, and if you go to jail, if me and Ron go to jail and we're friends, we can't, I can't even give them a chocolate bar. You know, I give them some soda, a chocolate bar, I'm going to get regulated on that. So the, the, the racism that's emanating from L.A. County Jail that's spilling out into our streets, you know, has, has such an impact on, on young men in particular, you know, growing up on the streets. And, and you learn those behaviors. Like I've, I've seen, you know, young people that uh, came through the youth center that uh, did time, went to jail and came out and they were talking very negative, you know, against black folk. And I'm like, you weren't talking like that, be, you know, before you went to jail. Oh, you don't know how they get down, you know? And it's like, no, no, listen, you don't know who, who gets that, how they, what are, you what are you talking about? They're like, well, the dudes that were in jail, you know, and I'm like, well, th th those aren't the best representatives, you know, of the black community. But on top of that, the conditions of the jail, I mean, they built the jail for, let's say, 5,000 people. There's like 9,000 people in the jail. You stress conditions on any two groups. I don't care if it's Koreans and whites. You stress the, the conditions. There's going to be violence. There's going to be conflict, right? So we have to understand sort of those bigger issues. But it's real important to say this, I think, as a Mexicano, as a Chicano in Los Angeles, we need to protect, we need to defend, we need to Mexican. Fight for the Black community in Los Angeles. I mean, think about what it would mean in Los Angeles if we lost, you know, cultural enclaves, like Lemur Park, for example. You know, I visited Ron one time uh, on a Sunday, and we went around, you know, they had beautiful music and food and 
you know, and it just felt really good. It felt like, you know what, it would be sad to lose that. But but that's a reality. The gentrification that's pushing out, you know, black folk in Los Angeles. Right. Uh, places like Inglewood, for example, um, you know, or Boyle Heights, you know, for the Latino community. Right. There, there's a lot of turnover going on. And so we need to be we need to stand strong to make sure that we to, to protect these communities in Santa Monica's Pico neighborhood. Same thing. Like if we don't fight for these communities, we're, it's going to be lost. And that's something that, you know, I want to I want to get into to talk a little bit about that. I want to ask this question, though. Um, there have been two resignations, right? Uh, Nuri Martinez resigned, Ron Herrera resigned, and there's been calls for two more resignations. So Kevin De Leon has stated that he will not resign. This is, you know, he just came out saying that. I know there's been protests. I, uh, Lisette, I saw you on the news. Lisette's been out there protesting in front of Kevin De Leon's house, demanding that he does resign. Um, listening to Kevin De Leon, you know, he says that what he said wasn't racist. And he wants and, and he wants to be a part of the healing process. Like, do you think, first of all, uh, the comments that Kevin De Leon made, are they racist? Or, or, or what is the problem? What's problematic about Kevin De Leon's role in that conversation? And um, should it, is there a place for Kevin De Leon in, in the healing process? I want to talk about a little bit about the healing process. But on the question of uh, you know, Kevin De Leon's role, should he resign? And, 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 and more is there a role for Kevin De Leon to be a part of the healing process? So do you have any, any comments? This is gonna come off is maybe harsh. But I think the entire political system has to be overturned. I think that uh, <laughs> many of us, oh. as people of color, we'll we of color. <laughs> want to get in political office. Most of those people oh, who seek political know. office and get in office <laughs> become our class enemies because they hey, want yeah. to be part of the ruling group. Uh, we saw it with Tom Bradley. I'm giving you some examples now. I can talk about somebody who's gone already. Tom Bradley comes from Calvert, Texas. That's where my mother was born. Tom Bradley, when we were struggling against uh, minority, the white minority in control of South Africa against apartheid, Tom Bradley welcomed Sean Clary. I'll never forget his name. He was the South African Council General. He gave him the key, what they call the key to the city. Had a big smile on his face. Tom Bradley was part of the Trilateral Commission. He was very much, he used to go to back home to Calvert, Texas. There's the main street with all the businesses, Hello? which are controlled by whites, run right through the center of town. The black people live on Garrett one side. Stoner, mutual and all the whites are on the other side. He used to always stay with white people, even though he's the grandson of a slave. He was a share, he grew up as a sharecropper. So I'm saying these people get in office only to become part of the ruling establishment, the ruling class. We had it with Obama. Obama got in office and put AFRICOM, the US military command in practically every African country. And they overturned progressive governments. <clears throat> they claim they're hunting down terrorists, but they're the terrorists. And many of our people can't see it because we get caught up in wanting to be, wanting to support somebody just because they have a black skin. Same happened with you. Many of you want to support somebody because he's got a brown skin. The whole system has to be overturned. And so um, when I first heard about this event, I was happy that it had gone public, that it was in the, pub in the eye of the public, because I said it would give us a chance to raise the questions about the entire system that need to be raised. And I'm saying the system itself has to be overturned. That's revolutionary, it calls for revolution. The people that have had the power have selfishly mismanaged the power. And those who seek to get in office, most of them, and you are, you are a noteworthy exception. I have to say, I've been knowing you, we've been working together for 30, about 30 years at least. And that ain't the stuff that comes out of your head and that's not your behavior. And that's appreciated. I thought about, I thought about people like Reyes Lopez Tejerina in New Mexico, who headed the Alianza, who was on the side of people fighting to regain their land, sending a telegram to the LA police chief, 
uh, back in the 60s telling him to stop arresting our people and 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 crashing into our office and all that. I think Which about I people like Michael Elizabeth my Elizabeth Petito Martinez, your ass. who also light complexion, Mexicana, but Petita Martinez uh, uh, authored a book, Letters from Mississippi. People would say, what's a Chicana doing? Putting out a book nigger, nigger, the title nigger, Letters nigger, from nigger, Mississippi. Nigger, nigger, but Petita was working for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and nigger. based in Mississippi because she was about solidarity with black people. So I think I, I thought about oh all my, those things. Oh my, I found you, nigga. Don't you? That's my reaction to it. Yeah, so that's deep. I mean, in terms of like having the whole system resign, you know, and, and we make it, and we make it, and we make it. And we make it <laughs> you know, I asked this. Uh, the, the, you know, if every person involved in that conversation resigned, do we eliminate racism or end the divisions that, exi that exist in our community? I mean, because that's what, what everybody's calling for right now is resignation. is with this revolution, with this complete change, we have to look to people who love people, look to people who don't have these faults, who are not selfish. I have a, one of the things we put out back in the day, is a book, the title of it is Change Yourself to Change the World. If you're gonna boot somebody from power, you can't be selfish and be about booting a selfish, greedy person that just to create a problem here. But I'm saying that all these things, none of these things, none of these uh, methods can be ruled out when we talk about taking power. We're the people, and uh, we sh our rights should be respected, and our lives should be respected, and we should not be uh, earning uh, income that's inadequate to take care for ourselves and our families, et cetera. There, there, there's a, there's a, a lot of talk right now about a healing process, mm -hmm. you know? And so maybe uh, uh, Lisette, if you can yeah. talk a little bit about this and Maria, I wanna hear your uh, comments as well. Uh, what does a healing process look like? You know, what, if, if, if that's what we're going towards and who should lead or facilitate this process? What are some ideas for that type of healing process to occur? There's been a lot said about restorative justice. Even Kevin DeLeon has brought that up. Um, but further than that, there's transformative justice. And one of the things that uh, in that process has to happen is that the aggressor doesn't really get to define, you know, where, um, where the harm is done or how it was done and how it is corrected. It's actually the people that were harmed directly that um, are supposed to um, re reflect and share when they're ready, um, you know, what was the harm and what needs to be done to correct it. So like, I, for example, like while I was offended as a Central Americana, I, I, I defer to um, the Oaxaqueño community. I defer to the African American community of South Central. I defer to all the different people that were that were called out, you know, from the from Koreatown, you know, um, from being the Armenian community, the Jewish community. Like, so I think that there's a lot of work that needs to be done, and I think one of the things that I've learned being a Central American or, you know, being indigenous to those areas is that coming here, I've had to learn Black history. I've had to learn Chicano history. I've had to learn Chinese history, Japanese history, because, you know, it only helps me understand how I could be a better citizen and a better uh, contributor to society around me, right? Um, I do think that their terms were dehumanizing when he compared, um, you know, a, the, a Black baby to a Louis Vuitton bag it harkens back to those times where white supremacists who have white body supremacy leanings, right, uh, compared babies or threw them into the, into the rivers and the swamps of Florida and fed them the crocodiles. How dangerous that is, right? Um, at the King Parade, no less, which I happened to grow up going to the King Parade when there were no floats because <laughs> they weren't investing it, right? So like, so what they're forgetting is that South Central also is made up of Afro-Mexicanos, afro Belizeños, afro Puerto Ricans, afro Salvadorans. At this point in our you know, lineage of time, we continue to, to become a diverse, diverse set of communities and families. Like uh, an offense to one is an offense to all of us. 
And, um, and also LA, going back to the history that's been shared, you know, was founded by, I believe, over a dozen um, families that had migrated from Mexico, over half of which were Afro-Mexicano, mm-hmm. right? Sure. So the majority of the founders of, of LA during that time were Afro-Mexican. So I think that they're being very ahistorical. And what hurts the most is to see people that kind of look like me deny our shared heritage. So I don't know, you know, I think I would point to my elders, my indigenous elders, you know, and I don't know how open they are. They might be, you know, more Catholic leaning and all that sort of stuff. But I think that, you know, once they do what's right, which is first step down and people have time, then they may offer them, you know, how, you know, different ways to make things right. But until they're right there holding on to their power and thinking that this is the way to go and this is the solution, it's just going to create a continued political crisis and economic crisis for, for residents of, of LA and beyond. So all of you believe that uh, Kevin De Nostra was lying? Anybody disagree with that? I do. Yeah, he sure was lying. Absolutely. Yeah. I think the whole system should be overturned. Oh, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just say, it's interesting. Many people in this country were shocked when in the 1960s, some of us, led by James Foreman, who was we call the old man in the Student Nonviolent Reporting Committee, <laughs> wrote the Black Manifesto and demanded $500 million in reparations from the white Christian churches and Jewish synagogues for their role in the slave trade. Most people in this country were unaware then, and they still are, because they go to church and, and, and read from the Bible and sing the songs and do all that but they don't know the church's history. Every denomination practically in this country were involved in the slave traffic and profited from it. And uh, when we demanded the money, the reparations, we stormed into churches, pushed the preacher out the pulpit. Some of us, I went to jail. Uh, I remember Jim Foreman went into Detroit, not in Detroit, in New York at 475 Riverside Drive, we call it the God Box. That's where the, uh, all the major Protestant churches have their headquarters. And he went in with a band of people. And when the preacher saw him come in, the preacher said, oh, when he saw Jim Foreman, he said, oh, God help us. And Foreman took his cane and wrapped it on the table and said, God can't help you now, MF, because we've come to get our reparations. <laughs> and but people in this country have been shot. But I noticed just uh, not even a month ago, NBC News finally came out and said, identified, talked about all these churches that had profited from the slave trade. The Catholic Church, by the way, is the largest corporate entity in the world. It has more assets than the four largest corporations inside the United States. We did all the research. and I'm just saying, people need to know that. When they go to church and next time you go to church and bow down and start humming what's in the Bible, think about the role of the church in in, in slaving our ancestors. So it's a big, a big, a big issue on on uh, you know on the reparations is what on I'm reparations. Saying. You know the question of reparations. There was a uh, a big a big case out of uh, uh, Bruce's Beach, I believe. Uh, what's the uh, mm-hmm. city? Is it a uh, Redondo or what? What yeah. city? Redondo, <laughs> Manhattan, Manhattan Beach, Beach. Manhattan Beach. Manhattan Beach. Manhattan Beach. And so there's a story about about a, a, a black uh, family uh, pushed out. They, they got pushed out. They got their their land taken away, and and now the government's stepping in uh, to make reparations. Right mm-hmm. uh, here in Santa Monica, there was uh, you know there was a down uh, down on uh, where the Civic Center is. In fact, they, there, there's pictures that I've seen where uh, white city leaders uh, were burning the houses of, of black people. That were at the uh, they call it the Belmar community right here on Fourth Street and Pico mm-hmm. uh, to to make way for the Civic Center. Mm-hmm. In fact, in the Pico neighborhood, which is the largest number of uh, you know black folks that live in the city, live in the Pico neighborhood. But the oldest black church is right here on uh, Bay Street, right on, almost on Fourth Street, because there was it served a large black community. And so uh, there was they, they turned it into a little park. There's still some you know the Civic Center and, and all that. And there's and there's a, a policy we passed so that uh, we can we can give housing affordable housing to those uh, uh, black uh, community members who who can 
prove or somehow have a connection. I'm not totally clear on the, on the criteria, uh, it, but, but essentially if you were pushed out of Santa Monica because of the freeway and the civic center, you would be first in line or you would have some type of preference, right? To get uh, housing, to get affordable housing. And, and, and I think, you know, we have to do better than that, you know, to get affordable housing, you know, you have to also qualify. So it's not, 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 not for everyone. But I think we need to do something better with the civic center and with the land that's there mm -hmm. because nobody's doing anything with that. So anyway, just that's a, a bigger discussion. Um, but let, let's talk a little bit about about systemic racism, you know, because uh, in fact, I was on my way over here. and I, I told I told my, my, my little boy, my 12 year old about what we're going to talk about today. <clears throat> and he made a comment about, oh, I know everything about racism. He's laughing. <laughs> but he said, if somebody says, if somebody calls me a, a, a beaner, you know, I know what to respond with, you know, I go, look, somebody calling you a bad name, that's prejudice, but racism is power, right? You have to de deny a person a job or, or uh, impact a person's quality of life. You know, I, 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 I was outside with him. I said, see the freeway? I go, that's systemic racism. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the freeway is not cussing at you or calling you a bad word or whatever. Uh, or, or putting you down, but you're, but it's violence. You're breathing uh, pollution, you know, and, and, and it's harming you, you know, uh, but it's invisible, right? It's, you know, you don't, you don't look at that as racism, but that when that freeway was put through the Pico neighborhood to get rid of all the uh, black and Mexican families and Japanese families and poor whites also, it wasn't just a racial thing, it was also a class thing. Um, that was, that was racist and it was classes, you know? So we got to understand systemic racism, right? Um, and so what needs to happen to address systemic racism in real tangible ways in Los Angeles? So Maria, what do you think? You've been in the labor movement. Economic justice is, is definitely a way to overcome, you know, the isms. But what, 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 what have you learned in the movement, you know, uh, fighting for workers and fighting for workers' rights and decent wages and, 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 and health benefits and so forth? Um, so from that perspective, so economic power uh, or any other issue that you think is important to address systemic racism in Los Angeles? So, I mean, um, I'll answer that question uh, in just a second. I kind of want to go back to on healing. this the healing yes, and yes. only because I think I, we've been hearing a lot about healing and I think we're rushing it. And mm -hmm. I think it's okay to sit with it. And as a mom, I think about, um, you know, like, um, you know, I had my child and my child didn't come overnight. It was a process. And even after she was born, there was so much, um, you know, there was so much work that I had to do with myself to really understand what motherhood uh, was going to bring for me. And I think there is this urgency and this desire to say, let's heal move forward because we don't want to address it. We don't want to address the issue. Right. Let's just push it through and let's move on. And I think going back to the systemic, uh, you know, systemic racism is we have an opportunity right now. Uh, and Kevin and Gil Cedillo, right? They have an opportunity to say, "Mia culpa." I, you know, I did this. And yes, absolutely, one hundred percent, unequivocally, what was said and how they participated is racist. There's no negotiation. It's it's a very black and white issue. And the fact that these politicians do not recognize and continue to sit there, like Lisette said, is, um, you know, is causing more harm for our communities, right? And it's, again, it's uplifting, um, you know, systemic racist, uh, you know, white supremacy values. And I think Kevin and Gil can do all the self-healing they want and really do, if they want to make amends to the community that they've hurt, the only way that they can, um, you know, truly, uh, you know, help and uh, move us forward is by resigning. And I think, you know, um, in terms of like the systemic racism and how it connects to labor, you know, I'm a union organizer. And a lot of the things that we that we teach is, um, and, you know, from this labor perspective is having a common understanding of what our values are. And I think that's something that's missing that we have to um, really understand is that we know that there are systemic racist, um, you know, um, systems in place to keep, you know, black, brown, people of color, women uh, in place. But racism exists to keep 
those white and rich and people with power, with money in place. And I think what's really important is for us to have international and local solidarity where we understand um, and and build a, a class conscious, a race conscious and a militant conscious, um, you know, um, systems in place where we're educating our youth, where we're educating the labor workforce and understanding, you know, that we have labor and that we have power. And I think, you know, um, it's kind of sad for me, you know, uh, kind of going back to what was your initial reaction to the audio? It's like Nuri and um, Gil and, and Ron Herrera from the labor movement. They have a very shallow understanding of what power is. Their understanding is we got to figure out how to move these like monopoly pieces to help advance our own individual political agenda. And what they didn't and where they fell short was how do we build solidarity and how do we build, um, you know, what are our values? What are we, what do we rally? We need to have, you know, um, address the homeless crisis, the housing crisis that we have here in LA. It mostly impacts black and brown people. We need to figure out, you know, um, radical, um, you know, um, you know, transformation to address uh, racism is, you know, affordable housing. It looks like um, reimagining what um, the incarceration, you know, the um, what the industrial um, prison industrial complex looks like in our communities. It's about really tackling and figuring out how do we provide mental health services um, to our youth in our community. That is how you challenge and the redistribution of wealth. You look at wealth in our communities, we know where the money sits and our communities do not have the money, they don't have the resources, and we should not be fighting for scraps. We got to figure out, identify who in our community has the money, who's controlling it, and how are they exploiting those resources and keeping our people, whether they're Oaxacanos, whether they're Black, whether they're Central American, there are people in place that are funding politicians to get elected to continue to advance their own personal agendas. And we know that money is coming, a lot of money is coming from real estate developers that are really, you know, driving and pushing their agendas to keep our people down. So for me is, you know, how do we fight systemic racism? Let's find the money. Let's figure out where the money is coming from. Let's organize workers. Let's organize the youth. Let's organize women, right? Let's organize all these amazing groups that already exist. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. I think the will is there, right? The mapping of who, um, you know, our allies are, are there. We need to figure out how we come together and whether that for me from labor, that means let's have a, a um, you know, a national strike. Let's have regional strikes where we hold our power from these, you know, folks that are holding, um, you know, our, our resources and let's just create disruption in order for us to reimagine um, what our community should look like. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just gonna say that at a time when um, we're, you know, there's this dearth of organizing that's needed for especially essential workers. And, you know, you have people that are willing to unionize, sort of like they kind of drop the ball, right? You know, um, labor has been um, slowly declining in their membership for decades. So this is the first time in history where you actually saw, you know, fast food workers and people, there's a, a revival of the labor movement so I, I feel concern about that, especially being that, um, you know, LA is kind of considered as the capital of the labor movement. But going back to your question about systems, to me in, in my um, independent studies and work, some of the stuff that I've been doing with uh, my partner, my work partner, Rob McGowan from Diving Within is developing uh, training around combating anti-Blackness. And what our um, approach includes in addressing systemic um, racism um, and anti-Blackness is you can't do that until you address the institutional racist practices, until you address the interpersonal racist practices, and until you address the internalized racism. So to me is how do we put leaders in office that hold those kinds of values that don't view um, our, um, you know, the, 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 need, the needs of the Black community as a zero-sum game when compared 
to the needs of other communities that, you know, that understand that without the contributions of, of you know, the civil rights movement, which was built by African-Americans, none of us would be voting and have office today, right? You know, I mean, I, I'm not in office, but we wouldn't even have a chance to, you know? Um, and the white women's suffrage movement did not include black women either. You know, black women asked for it and they refused to include them. So, you know, there's also a level of toxic, masculinity that's happening where I feel like sure. Nuri is kind of taking, you know, obviously she she went in and all that and convened the meeting, but why do the fellas get to walk off free? You know, I don't understand that. I, I you know, I think that um, it harkens back a little bit to that nationality thing that, or, or um, you know, I don't know. It's, it's a very misplaced sense of power that I think they have. And it needs to be addressed, which is why I brought book Hood Feminism today. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to reiterate again a point I made earlier about James and Grace Hall. It's an interesting piece they put out. It's called The Awesome Responsibility of Revolutionary Leadership. And they make it very clear, they made it very clear, this is in the 1960s, that we need to take power away from those who have the power. We're not talking about uh, treated the and treated dumb. I, that's why I made that point when I first began speaking. It's not about voting Democratic uh, over against somebody Republican and all that. It's interesting right now because this guy that's in the, in the White House right now just took, uh, I mean, how many millions of gallons of oil from the reserves so that the gas prices can lower, be lower so that in this election, it's only a couple of weeks away. Uh, more people will vote for Democrats because they'll credit a Democratic administra uh, administration, its president, Biden, with uh, lowering the price of gasoline. So that's how they'll get the vote. So they, we just get played. We get, and people get played over and over, and they go for it. But what James and Grace Paul said in this, in this piece is they said that we have to take power away from those who have the power. To do it, we have to create a revolutionary organization. They talked about a party. It doesn't have to be a party, it could be named a political party, but it needs to be a revolutionary organization. It's nationwide in scope, has international ties. They said there are four important ingredients for the leadership of this group. A, they said, unceasing ideological struggle. Unceasing ideological struggle. B, strict discipline. C, organized activity of every member. You don't get up in the morning and just do what you want to do, do your thing. Your activity is already uh, planned in terms of what you're going to do tomorrow and then Friday and Saturday and so on and Sunday. And then D, they said merciless self-criticism. Merciless self critic Merc you hear? Merciless. You have to own up to your weaknesses, to your shortcomings. So before I can criticize you, I've got to admit my own weaknesses, my own mistakes, my own shortcomings, and offer up a plan to address them and, and strengthen where I'm weak, and then I can criticize you. So we have to internalize conceptually these principles and create this organization and move to take power. For me, it's not about these people resigning. It's about overturning the entire system. Run them all out. Run them all out <coughs> and create a new system that's uh, led by the people. Um, if somebody says they're gonna run for office, they want to run for office. We're going to look them up and down, and we're going to people are going to have to stand up and vouch for the kind of values that they uh, demonstrated in the community. What has been their history? What kind of contributions have they made? What kind of risks have they taken? All of that will have to be looked at before we decide in this new government, this new mach political machinery that operates to move this country forward is put together. So that's where I'm coming from. Yeah, well, that, that's a really powerful position because you know the way the system works right now and sort of what everybody's touched on this, um, 
it, it's designed for, for the people with money to be in control, right? Because if you run for office, it, it takes campaign contributions to get the message out, right? The campaign is about message and then and then resources needed to put out the message. And, um, you know, like, like right now, there's an election in Santa Monica and they have a, a local ordinance that says that every, every candidate can only raise $410, like by every individual donor. So you have to get, you know, a lot of people to donate 410 to, to, to compete with the people that have what they call these political action committees or uh, IEs, uh, uh, you know, independent. independent expenditures. And so the government here in, 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 in this country has said that, uh, and the, the U.S. Supreme Court, you know, has, has, has basically said that you can give unlimited amount of money to the political action committees or these IEs, you know, and then and then so you stranglehold the candidate, you know, from from from, from competing. You can't because you're raising four hundred and ten dollars, you know, a donor. So as long as the system is is controlled by the money, uh, I, I think that it's going to be very difficult. That's why to, to the point, what Ron is saying is that you have to overturn the whole system. Um, there, there is a solution where you can have like a public finance, right? Where the where, where everyone running for office can only get so much and that's all you can spend. The problem is you have these political action committees where there's unlimited amounts of money. The government says that they can spend until that gets overturned, that's that that it won't work, you know, because you know they 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 will be able to keep keep that control. This whole question of a third political party, you know, we've seen that happen, right? Within the black community, you have the Black Panther Party even though they, they like to say the Black Panthers, but it's the Black Panther Party. They were trying to organize themselves, you know, to engage in the, in, in, in the system uh, through, through, through politics and, and voting. In the, uh, in, the, in the Chicano, Mexicano community, we had the Raza Unida Party, right? Which was pretty successful in some small cases, you know, in, in local uh, races, school board races, some city council races here and there. In Texas, they were more effective, where at the height of the movement, they garnered about 5% of the uh, electoral uh, of the of the vote, uh, and co and actually caused the Democratic Party to lose. And 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 what's interesting is that, uh, you know, the Democratic Party made a move to hurt La Raza Unida Party to eliminate La Raza Unida Party. Once once they started getting so successful, and they formed a group called the Mexican American Democrats. You know, so uh, really interesting in terms of the political system. And 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 yes, we are talking about politicians, right? And the people and those politicians were all supported mostly by the Democratic Party um, and also labor. Right. So Ron, the reason why they're meeting with Ron Rivera at the time is because uh, labor has so much power as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it comes down to what Ron talked about, you know, this idea of principles. You know, what are the principles that we need in our leaders? Right. Um, what, what, what are some 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 I guess some, some things that we might talk about talk about in terms of. Uh, you know, creating a multiracial movement, right? Because it's, it's, it's in Los Angeles right now, the demographics are what, what you know, so someone said this, that if the, if the a black community and the Latino community got together, uh, there would never be another white person elected mayor, you know? Uh, we have a race right now uh, where Karen Bass, you know, who's uh, black, you know, from South LA, is riding against, uh, running against Rick Caruso, uh, who is a very wealthy person, right? Who is known for building up malls and so forth. And um, so it's, it's an interesting dynamic in, in, in the politics of Los Angeles right now. Um, what, what is this incident? What, what impact does this incident have on this election? Like any, 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 uh, any ideas about or any, or any uh, reflection on how this incident does it does it help or hurt either of the two candidates running for mayor right now? Any ideas on that, or, or 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 how or how can this incident, you know, lead lead lead, lead to uh, any of the two candidates doing something uh, that that builds more unity or more multiracial unity in the city of Los Angeles? Any 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 ideas on on what they should do on these two candidates? Aside from both of them, one thing I've read in the newspapers that they both agree in in uh, supporting more police. So they, they want to both, uh, they both agree on that, that they want to increase the police budget. So they agree on, on that. And but what it, already is a police state. We live in a police state. This country is a police state. The police got their, uh, their uh, 
culture, policing culture in this country grows out of what used to be plantation police and slave patrols. I think the first one, as I recall, was 1704. I think maybe in South Carolina. Plantation police and police patrols used to break up meetings, uh, monitor curfews and enforce curfews, track down runaways, uh, punish them, sometimes kill them who were running away from the plantation. Um, everything police do today, they did on the plantations and they did to black people running away from their enslavers. And so it's just interesting that you made the point that uh, both these candidates are saying we need more police. In 1965, during the South LA Rebellion or the Watch Rebellion, I stood up the first night, confronted white police, helmeted heavily off, and I told them, you're just a white gang with badges, but we're going to whip you and run you out of here tonight. And we did. We ran the police out of, off of Imperial Highway and Avalon Boulevard, and they eventually, over the six days, of course, they brought in the National Guard. And we put the word out, we did we say it then, you cheat, because we, we thought it was just us against the police. Now you didn't brought uh, these people in. But um, so it's uh, it's when you ask about this mayor's race and how it might impact it, I, that's my comment. All these people that are on the, uh, they're all part of the same scam. They're all part of the same game that is run on our people um, day after day, year after year, generation after generation. And it's not going to stop until we... Uh, get rid of the charade and move uh, in the most organized stuff, Kwame Ture, Stokely Carmichael, one of the things he said that always stuck with me is he said, we lack organization. Organization is the key. We got people everywhere, but we're not organized. Organization is central to everything. And you've got to plan and you've got to plot. And uh, you've mentioned the Black Panther Party. I got, I knew the, all the Panther leadership, most of the Panther leadership. I knew some of the bravest Panthers and, and so on in the streets. They talked about uh, being the Black Panther Party, but they didn't do the kind of political organizing that needs to happen. They made a lot of serious mistakes. They recruited many members who were undercover police. They weren't careful enough to recruit people who were really committed to struggle and on the community, on the side of the community, they were police. And uh, so they made serious errors. And one of the mistakes that some of us make when we bring up the Black Panther Party all the time, and I don't mean to take this away from so many brave Panthers. I knew some brave, serious, committed Panthers. But the big, one of the biggest mistakes is this whole notion of self-defense that you're gonna uh, go slap a cop on the corner out there and then you run into a building that you've sandbagged and the police surround the building, they just simply wait you out or starve you out or tear gas you out, killing off some of your members. That's no way to wage a struggle. That's a serious error. Many of us said it years ago and I repeat it now. So we don't wanna make the mistake of promoting and glorifying uh, certain aspects of a group that uh, are very dangerous and, and don't help us move forward. So, so on the question, on, on the because we we're we're, we're uh, getting close to uh, to the end, and I, I want to open up uh, for any uh, uh, questions from the audience. If anybody has any questions, uh, uh, I want to give you all an opportunity to ask any questions from any of the panelists uh, before we conclude, because we have about fifteen minutes left. But you know. Part of what we're seeing right now with the social conditions in Los Angeles um, is understandable that the elected officials, right, running for mayor, would both say we need more police because uh, people are seeing the crime, you know, is going up, you know, uh, homelessness is going up, you know, and 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 and, um, and people are frustrated, right? Uh, in Santa Monica, we feel the same thing, you know, the residents here, they're kind of fed up with, you know their bikes getting stolen and their cars getting broken into. And, you know, the social conditions are, 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 are harsh. 
um, and, and people are frustrated. And the immediate response is, you know, we need more police to keep us safe. Uh, what's, what, what's your reflection on that for anyone who wants to talk about, you know, the, these social conditions, uh, which, which, which the, root, the root of it has, to, has somewhat to do with poverty and the history we're talking about of marginalization and so forth. Uh, what are some what are some solutions that these uh, let's say if 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 we can talk to both uh, candidates you know uh, what would we like them to what kind of plan or what kind of what kind of issues or or agenda should they be following to address the social conditions that we see that 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 are causing a lot of the homelessness and and the crime and so forth any any ideas that we we would like to share in terms of if we can impact the, both both Karen Bass and Rick Caruso's uh, race right now, uh, what, what what would we like to see front and center in their agenda to address the social conditions that we're struggling through in the city? Yeah, um, I apologize. I had a little bit of an allergy situation here, but I would say you know a lot of um, uh, organizers from LA that have been fighting the prison industrial complex for decades have been talking about the diversion of funds, police funds, <clears throat> to all the different types of social services that we need, right? Um, and the studies do prove, you know, that there is a correlation to just the, the influx of police funds and, and basically the deterioration of uh, the health conditions of, in particular, Black and Latino peoples, right? So if we look at the schools, though, there is, um, um, new policies that have been sort of enacted over the last decade and that have slowly been improving around school-wide positive behavior interventions and support. So basically it's a sort of um, more restorative justice approach to, to the conditions that we see in our schools. If we were to able to sort of extrapolate that into our communities, the issue though, of course, is that our generation is inheriting, you know, a police force that is totally militarized, right? So it's not such an easy exchange. I and mean, we're literally fighting a system that does not want to give up its guns and doesn't want to um, give up its ways. And so I think that um, we have to ask, you know, both candidates, although we know where one of them firmly stands, um, what will they be doing to address the prison industrial complex that continues to um, take in our children and our families at a disproportionate rate um, and or um, is also contributed to the you know housing, um, the lack of housing, which even though the black population is only 8% of the city, they make up 30% of the homelessness um, population, mostly in Skid Row. Um, and that has a direct correlation to the investment in police Funds, right. So <clears throat> as opposed to all the services that these folks have needed all these years, um, which housing and housing advocates have, have talked about for decades that they actually predicted this would happen 20 years ago. Um, so <clears throat> it's quite a conundrum that we're now in, you know, had it's sort of like, um, you know, climate change, you know, it's like now we see it and now we want to change it. But had we listened to the experts 20, 30 years ago. So I don't think I have all the easy answers, but we do need people that are no longer, you know, believing the hype, you know, and are really willing to roll up the sleeves and create different systems that don't further, um, uh, you know, uh, worsen the conditions of our people. <clears throat> Maria? Yeah, there's this concept um, in labor that we talk about disaster capitalism, right, on how, um, Folks use um, uh, key moments uh, of violence um, and turmoil, and um, how folks come in and uh, turn that into profit for a few, right? And I think LA, like I said earlier, is just um, so unaffordable. And I think a lot of our families are experiencing really intense and emotional poverty violence in different communities. Um, just this past week, there was like um, extensive LA Time articles where they talked about um, entire families and how COVID really impacted um, very heavily Latino and Black communities because they live in clusters because housing is no longer sustainable. And that is um, 
you know, that is inhumane that in the second largest city of the U.S. with, you know, one of the biggest um, economic um, developments and resources that we can't find the ability to provide folks the basic needs, right? Um, and that's food, housing, education. Um, and so, you know, if if we were, uh, you know, um, what I would ask, you know, Rick Caruso, um, you know, is like, will you um, commit to donate over the life, you know, over the next 25 years, donate all of your money, right? To actually, um, to resources, right? They're, they talk about, um, you know, and will they support, um, you know, will he support taxing the wealthy, right? And kind of what Lisa said, like, there's all these philanthropists that say, I want to be able to figure out where I want to donate my money. No, get, we should tax these, you know, um, you know, these wealthy people and the, our government system and our people need to decide and figure out where that money needs to be reinvested. And that is, you know, in poor communities and housing, um, you know, and um, job development and training. And I think that is something that's really important for our youth. Um, you know, college is just not sustainable anymore. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, resources that our, our youth don't have. And I think um, figuring out how do we invest in the youth and how do we, um, you know, end the violence, the poverty violence against people of color, um, you know, here in LA is really important. Um, and I want to hear, right, their platform. Um, it's not good enough. What we have now is not good enough. And we're seeing it, um, you know, through through the increase. And, you know, I know the LA City Council <clears throat> said that um, the moratorium that they enacted for COVID for housing moratorium is ending in January. If you think it's bad with homelessness, just wait till, you know, the moratorium expires. Um, you know, I don't think there's a comprehensive plan and I don't think they know... Um, we know how, our communities know how to fix it. We need to tax the wealthy and redistribute that wealth to our communities. But um, because they're, you know, um, they're taking all this money, although Rick will probably say, it's just my personal money. He's invested over $65 million into this political campaign. That's absurd, right? Um, that so much money is going into politics when that can be going into communities um, you know, for housing or other resources. Exactly. And these office seekers should also push these boards of ed education who have begun to kind of popularize the need for ethnic studies yeah. in the public schools to also also push for inter-ethnic studies so that brown and black, that history <clears throat> of solidarity between brown and black people can be brought out in the classroom as well. So that we don't just learn brown history in isolation or black history in isolation of one another. I think that's so powerful, you know, that, uh, and I'm glad you mentioned ethnic studies, the movement for ethnic studies, there's a big opportunity right there to, to really teach the next generation, you know, that, that, the, 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 that there's solidarity, that, that mm -hmm. we, I mean, we, we share community space together, like what, whatever hurts one group is gonna hurt the other group. And, and we need to work together. And I think ethnic studies does provide uh, uh, an opportunity, you know, to, to bring people together. To the next generation can learn a, a lot more. So I think there's there's a lot of promise there. You know? But it needs to be expanded, of course, right. too. Also to inter -ethnic. inter ethnic studies. Yes, correct. So you have a you have classes where you're learning you learn both from right. both. Yeah. The, the complexity of our city. Like I remember one time I um, did some teaching at um, I believe it was at one of the schools out in Koreatown, and you'll see, you know, all kinds of interracial sort of you know, uh, relationships happening at a whole different level than what even our generation is used to, like Oaxaqueño and Korean, you know, kids dating and, you know, whatnot. So, like, the city is changing in a very dynamic and quick way. And I think that it really behooves us to start, you know, to kind of, like, bring down our own internal, like, walls about where those clean delineations are. I, I think for the next generation, that's not gonna really speak to them fully. You know, they're gonna be all those things at once. Like my child is African American, Japanese, you know, and Salvadoran, indigenous. So it's like, you know, uh, yeah, I think we're, we're, we're gonna, ha we have quite a challenge ahead of us. We live, we live in, in, in California, which is now, I think, the, the fourth 
or fifth largest economy in the world. I think we just uh, we just passed that. We're the fourth now. We just passed Germany. Right. So California alone. And we're probably the most diverse state in the United States, right? And Los Angeles is probably the most diverse city, um, you know, definitely in California, but uh, probably one of the most diverse cities in the world. So if anything, if, if we can teach anything to the world, right, has to be how we get along and how we build together and how we deal with the issues of poverty and marginalization, you know, together and how we build these communities, healthier communities, right? That's the promise that we have. And that's really the struggle in front of us. And, and, and I hope that, you know, this moment right now that we're facing, uh, that we turn this around, you know, and we, and we really uh, re-inspire ourselves, you know, learning from, the, learning from the past, learning from the movements of the past, and, and, and really committing ourselves, renewing our commitment, you know, to addressing these problems uh, in our, in, in that affect, you know, all people, you know, but in particular, those that have historically been marginalized, you know, because when, when we help those at the bottom, uh, all of us, all of us succeed, you know, we, we, we end up with better communities, healthier communities uh, that all, all, all of our families you know, to raise families in. I mean, all of us, you know, all of us up here are parents, you know, uh, we want we want the best for our children and we want our children's children, you know, to have a, a better life. Um, so with that, I want to just uh, see if there's anybody in the audience that has a question before we conclude uh, today's panel. Yes, sir. I just have a statement. And I just think the focus needs to be on building bridges. And you do that through communication. And the way that we're communicating tonight, we need to be able to go into Beverly Hills and have community meetings and let them hear what you're saying. And that way, if we build bridges between different communities, that way we can have a better understanding. We have to have better leaders. We know that. We also have to have term limits. But it's all about building an understanding, building bridges from all different people. And the way that you do that is through communication. And that's one thing that we do not have. And that's the direction I firmly believe that we need to go. Great, thank you very much. Anybody else? Anybody else have a comment or a question? Okay, so with that, I wanna thank our panelists. Thank you, Ron, Lisa, Maria. Thank you for sharing your words of wisdom and your voice. And uh, okay. thank you all for coming uh, today. Yes, Ali, go ahead. Yeah, so my question is, what can the youth do to help to decrease the racism? Like people like, like 20 and younger, like we can't go into the politics right now, but like, like the, the youth, like what can they do to help somehow? Well, real quick, even you can get involved in politics. I mean, uh, it, even if you're 12 years old, you can knock on a door, you can get involved, you know, uh, and getting people to vote. Um, young people have a lot of power, you know, if, if, you know, being on the school board, I remember every time that more than 10 people showed up, like 10 young people showed up. Anytime 10 students showed up, they got pretty much everything they wanted. And, and so imagine if you bring 30 people, 50 people, 100 students to a school board meeting, you can make the difference. So young people have a lot of power, but it goes back to what Ron was talking about, is how do you organize? How do you, how do you come together? You know, and, and, and that takes, you know, uh, it takes time. You gotta, you know, it's like passing out the flyers, getting people to show up, having an agenda, you know, learning, learning some of those leadership skills and something that you can, you can harness here at the People You Can Family Center uh, for sure. Yeah. Ron, you have and to learn our history together. Learn our history together and build on it and create organizations like African and Latino Youth Summit. Here you had black and brown who we used to do retreats where they studied the history and talked about how to build on it. And we even took students, black and brown, to Mexico, to Costa Chica, to Oaxaca and Guerrero, where the black, the Afro-Mexican concentrated, Afro-Mexican people are concentrated. But these are the things you do as well. I also, I also think, um, you know, kind of going back to how do we address systemic racism, I think the government has an opportunity to like invest resources in providing the youth, right? And I think the youth can be vocal right now to demand these resources to build the bridges to say, we there is a desire that we want to be part of the change and we need the resources. And I don't think it's a time to be um, apologetic. I think when I was in high school in the early 2000s, 
I was like really shy. And I, you know, I was part of the movement at Santa Monica High School to fight for ethnic studies along with Oscar and Elias, um, Serna, right? And um, it was very, uh, we didn't, I didn't have the skills, but I think being involved in youth centers, being involved in the community, community like Oscar said, canvassing, I take my seven-year-old to knock on doors and do door hangers to support candidates that stand, you know, they may not look like me, but they definitely stand by the values. Um, and I think um, it's really important to, um, I think it's okay to have these discussions about race and it's important, right? Um, we're not going anywhere and we need to figure out how we can coexist um, and have that language. And let me just inject that, this to that. It should start in the elementary school, it should be in the high schools, and they have a class on social awareness and social justice. And let's the kids speak and we feel what the kids listen to them. And if we can start at an early age, because we have a cancer in our society, we need to cut that cancer out. Mm -hmm. And so before I lose my train of thought, I just think that we need to have a social awareness class in all the schools. Mm -hmm. Bring that out because kids today, what hurts me, they think it's cool to hate. Mm -hmm. And that's a new thing that's out now among high school kids. They think it's I can't say another word like cool to hate, and it's not cool. Yeah. Racism is not cool, and we need to let them know that. Yeah. And a lot of the problem is self hatred. I grew up with a lot of self hatred. You grew up hating yourself, feeling you're inferior because that's what society is promoting. Yeah, yeah I would say that, you know, either kids are taught to hate or <clears throat> they're taught to be silent. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think that um, one, Find mentors and mentors could be older or younger, right? Um, stay open, stay curious, right? Educate yourselves and also others around you. Don't be afraid to agitate, you know, remain a critical thinker, organize, act, and make a lifelong commitment to justice. Like I was just out there, you know, at the encampment, and they were like, be ready. One of the elders was like, be ready to be here in 25 years. What's that? <laughs> you know, so. Really, um, it's a lifelong commitment. And then also take care of yourself. You know, be willing to, um, you know, get that rest when you need it because the system isn't going to always look out for you is what history tells us, right? So always be willing to take your time out and make sure that you and your loved ones are okay. So with that, uh, you know, we, we, are, we are here uh, on the shoulders of people that have made great sacrifices for us to be where we're at right now, you know, and, um, we have an obligation, you know, to, to honor those people, to honor our ancestors, to honor those that came before us that, you know, fought the good fight, you know, for social, racial, environmental, economic justice. And that's something that we have to commit ourselves to. So we're going to continue to do that. We're not going to let this incident that happened, you know, set us back, but we're going to use this incident, you know, so that we can move forward, you know, and today is uh, our, our uh, you know, our, 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 uh, attempt at doing that, you know, we, we, we are committed, uh, you know, lifelong commitment, uh, and we will continue to work, you know, to make this a better city for all. So with that, uh, thank you all very much for coming. Thank you uh, for those who uh, uh, listened in on, on, is it Facebook Live? Is that where we're at right now? We're on Zoom right now. We're on Zoom right now. So thank you all uh, who uh, listened in. God bless you all, and keep up the struggle. God bless you. And so.